Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a series. This is the end of my third week of teaching from John chapter 14. And this is a record of what Jesus told his disciples the night before his crucifixion. They were going to enter into the worst time of their entire life, and Jesus told them things specifically for the purpose of them not being discouraged, not being defeated. He said in John 16, 1, that he spoke these things so they wouldn't be offended, so that they could continue to operate in faith. Of course, the disciples didn't follow through. They all forsook him and fled. It was a very bleak time in their life. But Jesus was preparing them. In a sense, I believe he took everything that he had taught them for three and a half years and just went back over kind of like cliff notes and just gave a real quick uh, reminder about don't let your heart be troubled, believe in God, put everything into perspective. And what I've talked about the last few days was you've got to know him, that he's the answer to everything. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And yet these disciples didn't truly know who Jesus was. So that's what I've talked about up to this time. And we're just continuing to go through all of these things that were listed in John 14, 15, and 16. We come now to John chapter 14, verse 12. And boy, this is a powerful passage of Scripture that has really impacted me. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. You know, he started off this verse by saying, verily, verily. That just means truly, truly, or it's the truth. It's the truth. Everything Jesus said was the truth. But when Jesus had to preface his statement by saying, I'm telling you the truth, and then repeat it and say, I'm telling you the truth. The reason he did this was because this was going to be such an astounding statement that people would think, surely he couldn't mean what he says. This isn't possible. And so he started it by saying, I'm telling you the truth. And he repeated, I'm telling you the truth. This is true, regardless of how unreasonable this sounds. Jesus spoke the truth, and the truth is that he that believes on him, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Boy, that is one awesome passage of Scripture. You know, I've actually heard people take this verse before and in a sense, try and do away with it. Diminish the impact of it by focusing on that the greater works are that now we can be on television and radio and we can put out CDs and we are reaching masses of people and reaching more people than Jesus ever reached when in his physical body and that this is what this is talking about. Personally, I don't believe that these are the greater works, but I'm not even going to debate that. I just want to focus on the part of the verse that it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works. Let's not even talk about the greater works right now. Let's just focus on the works that Jesus did. Jesus could call people by name that he had never seen before. Zacchaeus, come down, for I must dine at your house today. He could operate in gifts of the Spirit. He told Nathaniel, he says, before that... Philip called you, he says, while you were still under the tree. And he spoke to him and told him things. He knew where Peter could go and get the coin that was needed to pay the taxes for him and for Peter. He says, go down to the water and pull out a fish, and the coin that's in the mouth will be enough to pay our taxes. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Jairus' daughter from the dead. He opened up blind eyes. He healed the lame, the mute. He, he caused to speak. These are the works that Jesus did. And he said, I'm telling you the truth, that if you believe on me, you will do the works that I do and even greater works. Some people try and just skip over the works that he did and say, oh, we're doing the greater works. Until you get to where you're opening the blind eyes, seeing the dead raised, until you're operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and calling people by name and doing things, don't even talk to me about the greater works. You can't just pass over this. It's like a ladder. 
you can't just reach the top of the ladder without going through those rungs of the ladder that are down there on the lower part. You got to start here. You got to first of all do the works that Jesus has done and then come tell me about how you're doing the greater works. Again, that's a topic for another day, another discussion. But this is powerful that we can do the same works that Jesus did. You know, I, I don't claim that I have uh, obtained unto this perfectly. But you've got to remember that when I first got really turned on to the Lord, I was in the Baptist church. And, you know, I don't know if this is true of all Baptists, but the group that I was with taught that miracles ceased with the apostles, that they weren't for us today, that miracles didn't even happen today. And so, based on my experience, the people that I knew, I didn't know one person that had been healed in the last 2,000 years. I didn't know that there was any miracles happening. Every time in the Baptist church that, and I'm not against Baptist. I have people write me all of the time. If it wasn't for the Baptist, I, pr I might not have been born again. I praise God for the good that I got, but I'm just saying that the church that I was in taught that these things passed away. And every time they would come to a passage of Scripture, like in Acts chapter uh, 3, where the man was healed at the gate of the temple, and he went walking and leaping and praising God, they would spiritualize that. And they would say, we were all like cripples, but when we got born again, now we're able to walk and leap and praise God in the spirit realm. And they would spiritualize it. And when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I remember the very first time I read Acts chapter 3, and it dawned on me. I was 18 years old, and it was the first time it ever dawned on me that this literally happened. I had had it spiritualized so much, I just somehow or another translated, interpreted everything to where it had no physical, direct application. It was all a spiritual comparison, an illustration. And it had just gutted the power of some of these scriptures, the way that it was approached. There's people that try and do that right here. But this is saying that we will do the same works. And when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this is a verse that the Lord spoke to me that just changed my life. I mean, it dawned on me that I'm professing to be a believer. And if I'm a true believer, I will do the same works that Jesus did and even greater works. And you know what? I started reading the Bible with a new paradigm, a new way of looking at it. And I began to start praying and saying, God, help me to do this. And I don't want to just major on this verse. I've got other things I'm wanting to go on to. But let me just quickly say this, that I remember... One of the first times this verse really impacted me, I just made a decision that, you know what, this verse is true. This was Jesus speaking. And he said, we will do the same works. And there's other scriptures that go along with this, like Mark chapter 16, 17, and 18. It says, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. They shall drink any deadly thing and shall not harm them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And there's many, many other scriptures that go along with this. But it says if we're true believers, we will have these miraculous signs follow us. Mark chapter 16 verse 20 says that the Lord worked with them, confirming the word with signs and wonders following. If a person is truly preaching the true word of God, there will be miraculous manifestation. Boy, I could stop right here and preach on this for a few weeks because I tell you the vast majority of the body of Christ today is proclaiming something without any demonstration. There is no evidence. There's no miraculous power be evidence in their life or in their ministry. And if we were to apply the word of God, the scriptural precedent to this, like in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I believe it's verse 20, Paul was talking to the people who criticized him, and he, he reasoned with them for four chapters, and finally he just came down to this. He says, when I come, it's not going to be anybody, anybody's word anymore. Anybody can come up with words, but he says, it's going to be those who have demonstration in their life. I'll know not the speech of those who are puffed up, but the power, because the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power and in demonstration of the Spirit. So basically, Paul, he reasoned with them, but he says, when I come, he says, we aren't going to talk anymore. If you don't have any power in your life, then you have no right to talk.
Amen. You know, if we were to apply that today, I can guarantee you there are churches, pastors all over the world that they can talk a good game, but there's no demonstration. There's no power of God in their life. And if we were to apply the scriptural principle to them, then you know what? We shouldn't be listening to people that don't have any demonstration of the power of God in their life. No miracles taking place. No people's lives being changed. I know that there's people who are offended by that, but I'm telling you, we'd be better off if we just use this as a way of finding the people who are true leaders and say, if they're really believing on him, they will do the works that Jesus did. And if they aren't doing the works that Jesus did, if people aren't being healed, if people aren't being set free, if lives aren't being changed, then you shouldn't be listening to those people. Those are some strong statements, but those are absolutely true. And when I first came across this verse, I started just focusing on what Jesus had done, specifically raising the dead. And I started praying, and I stood on this verse, and I said, you know, it says the works that he did. He raised the dead. He raised the widow's son from the dead at the city of Nain. He raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He raised Lazarus from the dead. I began to meditate on those and say, praise God, I'm a believer. I'm going to see the dead raised. I began to start speaking it before I'd seen a single person healed. I hadn't even seen a cold healed. And I started believing for the dead to be raised. And anyway, it's a long story, but did you know I got so focused on this that I got to where I was dreaming that I was raising people from the dead. I mean, I was just consumed with I was going to see the miraculous power of God in manifestation. And when I was in Pritchett, Colorado, I had a situation where I'd been ministering to a man for months, and anyway, he died. The sheriff was there trying to get the, uh, uh, all of the machinery stuff out, the defibrillator to be able to try and restart his heart. I walked in and uh, saw his wife kneeling beside him in a chair, and she was crying and saying, Oh, God, bring Everett back from the dead. And when she said that's the first time I realized he's dead. But you know what? I'd prepared myself. I'd been believing that the works that Jesus did, I would do also. And so I just spoke and commanded Everett's body, I mean spirit, to come back into that body and for him to be raised from the dead. And he just sat up, started talking. It was miraculous. I've seen a number of people raised from the dead, culminating in my own son being raised from the dead. And did you know, it had been about 10 years or so since I'd seen a person raised from the dead, and I came across this verse again and thought, you know, this isn't something that you just do one time. Jesus raised multiple people from the dead. And so I began to start praying again and started uh, focusing on this and believing for the miraculous power of God, and it got to the same thing. I started dreaming. I would dream and see a dozen people raised from the dead every night in my dreams. And then my own son died, and by the grace of God, he came back to life. I'm saying, brothers and sisters, this isn't just for me or a full-time minister or somebody who has a gift of miracles or a gift of healing. It says, if you believe on him, the works that he did, you will do also. Man, that's powerful. I want to encourage you with this. There are some of you facing situations and you just feel so hopeless and helpless and you may have come from a denomination similar to mine that says miracles don't happen today and you aren't you're taught not to believe for anything i'm trying to change all of that in you and let you know that god wants you to have a miracle there's some people right now watching this program that it's god that had you listen to this program you don't normally listen to me you don't normally watch christian television you're wondering what you're doing listening to this. And you know what? The Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, and God is trying to get you to believe that He is real, that He is alive, that He wants to do a miracle in your life. And if you would humble yourself right now and receive it, the power of God would come upon you, and you could believe and receive a miracle. You could see blind eyes open, deaf ears open. You could see the lame walk, the dumb talk. You could see people raised from the dead. This is for believers. It's not limited to just people on television. This is for Joe Blow and Jane Doe, Christian. I tell you, God's trying to stir some people up today. 
He wants to do a miracle in your life, but he can't do it outside of you. It comes through you. You have to believe. If you're born again, this power is on the inside of you, but you have to release it by faith. And our discouragement and despair and our wrong teaching stop this. It bottles it up. It keeps it from flowing. I believe that the Holy Spirit's trying to encourage some of you today to believe God for something big. The works that he did, you will do also. Man, that's awesome. You know, since I've started believing this, I, I don't see every single person healed, and I don't blame that on God. I believe that if Jesus had complete control of me, that I'd see every person healed. I really do. I don't think it's God's fault. I'm still not where I should be, but praise God, I'm not where I used to be. I still don't see everything done perfectly, but you know what? I have seen blind eyes open, multiple, many people, many people. I, I remember one service in Mobile, Alabama, where we had 12 uh, deaf people healed in one service. I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen people come out of wheelchairs. I've seen people raised from the dead. I don't do it as perfectly as I should. I don't do it as completely as I'm going to do. I'm getting better. But you know what? I can say that I have seen this verse come to pass in my life. And I believe that God wants that for every one of you. In the 13th verse, he says, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Well, you know, all of religion today is focused on trying to explain these verses away. Verses 12, 13, and 14, talking about doing the works of Jesus. Ask anything, whatsoever you ask, I'll do it. Most of religion is in the process of trying to discredit these verses. You know why? Because if these verses are true, and yet people in our churches are just struggling and dying. I mean, most of them, you couldn't tell any difference between them and their unsaved neighbors. They get sick the same way every time of the year, every time there's a flu season, every time there's any virus that comes through. They're as sick as their unsaved neighbors. They're as poor as their unsaved neighbors. They get laid off from work. Their marriages are falling apart. The divorce rate in the church is nearly identical to the divorce rate in the world. And on and on you could go. And if these verses are true, well, then that means that we are not preaching the true gospel. We aren't truly believing on the Lord. We aren't living up to our potential. And that has the potential to make people feel uncomfortable and to feel like we're missing something. It might interrupt their sports schedule. It might interrupt their television schedule, and they may not be able to sit and watch as the stomach turns all day long every day. If these things are true, well, then that means we're missing what God has planned, and it puts a responsibility on us to go to seeking God. And instead of most people humbling themselves and accepting that responsibility and starting to seek after God and run the risk of believing for something more than what the average person is doing, instead of even taking those risks, the average church today is in the process of trying to say, no, these verses don't apply to us. No, you can't expect this. And they try and tell you that sometimes God answers no when the scripture does not say that. Second Corinthians chapter 1 says, all of the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen. The Lord never says no to something that he's promised. God is not the one who's putting sickness on you to teach you something. God is the one who wants you to live in victory. And by saying this, I can guarantee you there are some people saying, but I tried and it didn't work and so you're condemning me. Well, I've tried and it didn't work every time for me. Before I saw people raised from the dead, I saw three or four people that I prayed for who died while I had my hands on them, and they didn't come back from the dead. I'm not blaming God for that. I'm saying that I didn't, uh, I don't know exactly what it was. It could have been them. It could have been me. It could have been things that I didn't understand, but it's not God who failed. It was me who failed. I'm not condemned by that, but also I'm not complacent. I just kept believing God harder and saying, God, what I'm missing, teach me. And eventually, I began to start seeing the supernatural power of God operate in my life. And there are people watching this program that you've tried to believe God because something didn't work. You now are in the mode 
of blaming God and saying, well, it's not God's will because I believed and if anybody ever believed, I believed. And rather than you admitting that somehow or another you failed, it's easier for you to just blame God. It must not be God's will. God doesn't heal every time. God doesn't want us to live in total victory. And so you're now preaching that God is the source of your problem. These verses say if you are a true believer, you will do the works that Jesus did that whatsoever you ask in his name, that he will do it, that the Father may be glorified. If you ask anything in his name, I will do it. That's what the Word says. And yet there are multitudes of people who call themselves Christians who oppose this and are fighting against it. I am not yet living this completely. I don't see everything work as well as it should. There's things in my own body that I'm believing for that aren't exactly the way they're supposed to be. But I guarantee you there's a lot of things in my own body that have already been healed. I know I'm moving in the right direction. And man, I am not blaming God for any failures on my part. God wants us to live in victory. And you've got to accept that. And so in the next verse, in verse... 15, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. And this is what I'm going to begin to start talking about. I'll go into this on our programs next week in much more detail. But after he talked about that believing we can do the same works that he did, ask anything in his name and he will do it. These promises that seem so far beyond the reach of any of us that many people just discredit them and say, this isn't for us today. Right after he talks about this, this total, complete victory in Christ, then he starts talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And this is the point that I want to really emphasize next week as we get into this teaching, that in order for us to begin to start living the abundant life that Jesus has talked about here and has made available, you have to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You have to start having the power of the Holy Spirit work in you. The Christian life isn't just difficult. It's impossible. It's supernatural. For you to turn the other cheek when somebody slaps you, for you to go the second mile, for you to bless those who curse you, this isn't normal. It's not natural. You can't do it in your own strength and in your own power. You have to have the power of the Holy Spirit flowing in you. And brothers and sisters, there's many, many people watching this program who you're born again. If you were to die right now, you'd go directly to heaven. But you do not have the power of the Holy Spirit. You are incapable of operating in the things that God has talked about because you haven't yet received this power from on high. I'm going to be explaining this more. I encourage you to please listen and uh, take advantage of these programs as well as the materials that we're offering. But I'm telling you, this is a key. You cannot live a victorious Christian life without the power of the Holy Spirit. And most Christians, or let me say many, maybe most Christians are not flowing in the power of the Holy Spirit. So this is going to be really, really important. I want to encourage you to listen to our announcer as he gives you some information about how you can get these materials. And then join me again next week on our Monday's broadcast as we continue the gospel truth. Today's complete teaching titled, Christian First Aid Kit, was recorded live at a recent Gospel Truth seminar. This series has over six hours of teaching and is available on either audio CD or DVD. Each is available for 19 pounds. This teaching is also available on DVD as seen on our daily TV program. You can receive it for 19 pounds when you contact us. Or you can get the Christian First Aid Kit as part of the Survival Kit package. In addition to Christian First Aid Kit, this package also includes the Christian Survival Kit, a 16-part series. Together, these two series provide 22 hours of teaching. The entire package has a catalog value of 55 pounds. But today, you can get the Survival Kit package for just 50 pounds when you order. The fourth audio teaching in today's series is available for three pounds when you write or call. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this fourth CD titled 
Christian First Aid Kit, Part 4, free of charge. We'd like to remind you that we're offering Andrew's latest book titled Effortless Change for £8.50. Contact us today to get your copy. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. A rusty nail nearly destroyed this young man's life. We got to admit you to the hospital right away. We think it's best to amputate your leg as soon as possible, maybe even within the hour. I felt like, no, this is not the thing to do. So I talked to the doctor, I was like, is there any other way? Massive doses of IV antibiotics and pain meds. Months in a medically induced coma. An active athlete and musician confined to a wheelchair and crutches. Witness Wednesday morning's miracle. Don't miss it. Log on to www.awmi.net. Look to the left. Click on Ministry News and discover what's happening at Andrew Womack Ministries. in their home in Kathmandu, Nepal, Bob and Dawa Wesley stumbled across the Gospel Truth broadcast with Andrew Womack, and their lives were changed forever. When I found out that how much God loved me and what He did for me, I started understanding the Gospel, actually. Desiring to fulfill God's call on their lives, Bob and Dawa moved to Colorado Springs and attended Karis Bible College. Then it was back to Nepal and back to work. I started walking towards my office and I started seeing these two little boys and their feet was cracked and you know their clothes were really, really dirty. I asked the Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said, feed them. With that direction from God, their ministry was born, feeding the destitute boys of Kathmandu both physically and spiritually. I've always focused on sharing the gospel with these kids. And it is only the Word of God that changes the lives of the people. It is only the Gospel. Another changed life, changing the world. Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College.